All right, we are gathered here today to discuss the documentary King in the Wilderness. So I was thinking that we could just sort of hop into it, but before we um, before we get going, maybe we could all introduce ourselves for anyone who decides to watch this. I'm Shalanya. <laughs> I wish I could point at individuals because I, I realize that every single time I do that, neither one of the other people knows whether or not that they should uh, <laughs> say anything. We're all in different positions on each other's yeah. screens. Um, since it's focusing on me, I'm Haley. Hello. <laughs> and I'm Lauren. All right. So um, I guess that my first question for you guys, and I'm hoping to just get like a conversation going um, rather than like read through a bunch of questions. Um, when did you guys first hear about this documentary and um in watching it like did you watch it recently or did you watch it a while ago have you seen it a couple times what's your experience with this work um so i watched it probably about a week and a half ago i actually didn't know it existed at all until i saw it on the the reading list so i was when i saw that i was like oh so it piqued my interest same here. I hadn't heard of this uh, documentary before um, this opportunity came our way to watch it. And so I got my copy right here. I just finished watching it um, for the second time just now. But I watched it um, along with Haley like a week or so ago as well. Very cool. I don't remember where I heard about this, but I didn't hear about it. Um, I heard about it relatively recently and I was like, hmm, this looks interesting. And in terms of thinking about the list, like when we think about... Um, part, of, part of my thinking in terms of including this documentary on the list was, um, you know, when we think about like the history or the story of civil rights, um, like King is a figure, of course, that looms large in, in anybody's telling, right? Like even if you only ever, um, even if the only thing that you ever took in came from like some history class you took in elementary school, like you heard about him, right? And so then you have like this, this, documentary that's like you know what we're gonna look at this a little we're gonna tell an um untold story it seemed like that automatically would be interesting right because i think that like when we have these figures who um in our national narrative like have all of the rough edges just like burnished off anything i think that like provides a little bit more texture is mm -hmm. interesting um so I guess my first thing that I'm super curious about is um, what spoke to you about this film, if, if anything? I guess I'd, I'd start um, by answering that by saying, um, I guess I wasn't really aware of the complexity of all of um, the civil rights movement's responsibilities under King's leadership toward the end there. Um, the, the idea sort of morphing from simply focused on civil rights, um, racism, eradicating racism in the American South and moving that into totally new uh, directions, taking the struggle North and realizing, oh wait, this struggle isn't only about racism, it can't. It has to be about fighting um, uh, economic, uh, poverty, fighting poverty and fighting also the military industrial complex and having to tread, feeling like already um, there's such a huge, huge contribution that uh, Martin Luther King makes to um, one of those things and realizing that through this, 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 I think this documentary does a good job of highlighting just um, the, uh, the weight of the responsibility at that point later in his life of, okay, hold on, I, I can't be silent about the war in Vietnam. I got to speak out about that, right? Or like, I, I have to go down to Memphis and support these sanitation workers who are striking and uh, mistreated. I have to do this, that. And um, just, just feeling like, oh man, this... This, this man is um, a workaholic. I mean, he just doesn't stop. He's a dynamo. And that really spoke to me. Mm -hmm. I think what really spoke to me about this documentary is, well, what really intrigued me at first is that we hear about all of these accomplishments that Dr. King has done for the civil rights movement, but 
um, I kind of wanted to see more into who he was as a person and just like the the weight on his shoulders because it like you were saying Lauren it's this huge weight like all of these different things and how they're all uh, like poverty and racism you know classism the war in Vietnam all of these things are kind of interconnected in some way in the in the civil rights movement and I, I wanted to kind of what I wanted to get out of this documentary was a bigger understanding of the the complexities and how all of these things actually related to one another and how he really affected all of that. Um, so I think what really spoke to me is just the 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 depth um, that he went to to uh, address these problems and how it wasn't always easy. It was not easy at all, <laughs> but like him being involved in more than just the the racial equality movement um just like what kind of weight that was on him and it kind of helped me see more of who he was as a person it, it offered more it offered more depth more texture like you were saying <laughs> i feel like one of the things that really stood out to me while i was watching the film um was a lot of the body language. I mean, I like to watch people's body language anyway. Like I think our bodies tell the truth sometimes when um, when like we are managing our words, you know, actively managing our words, but like we're not often like managing our body language. And what struck me a lot during this film is just how m much um, listening you could see happening like when he was doing interviews and when he was talking to people like you could tell that he was like okay mm -hmm. what is this person saying to me mm -hmm. let me process what this person has said to me and now i'm going to respond to what this person has said to me and it really made me think about the contrast of the way that we think about sometimes the way that um activists are portrayed versus like what we saw here, right? Like when you listen to, like right now, even in the um, in the news, the way that different protesters are portrayed, like all of these people have gathered upon this and they're making these demands and this, that, and the other, they're not necessarily being portrayed as like thoughtful people who are very strategic and who are like integrating their actions and their words into a overarching philosophy. And I feel like, just watching his body language um, really made me think about that. Or um, when we saw the scenes where he and um, Stokely Carmichael were both marching at the same time, like yes. both of these men were listening to every single word that mm -hmm. was happening. And they were like in that moment responding. And I was just thinking about like what that takes, right? Oh my gosh, yes. I'm so glad you brought that up. That was a, such such a powerful part of this documentary and, and talking about kinetically, like you're saying, like watching the body language, watching how, I mean, that, that's, that stuck out to me twice. There's that um, interview footage, I think from like 1967, where um, a reporter, the, the camera, it's a very interesting camera angle um, where the camera's like directing up, you see the back of the reporter's head and you see King kind of up um, in a church somewhere, I don't know where, against the stained glass. And he is locked in, like you're saying, Trelanya, to just exactly what this man is asking him. Um, and he's very carefully choosing his words. Um, he's, and he's saying something, he's being asked something to the effect of, you know, what's up with your, like, I have a dream speech. Where do you feel like we are? We're at with that, um, you know, f five plus years later or, or four plus years later. And he says, um, well, in some aspects, and I, you, all, you watch his mouth like he's he's thinking he's like, OK, I'm, <laughs> I'm about to get this out. Um, but he he says something like um, in some regards, uh, that dream has turned into a nightmare. And um, it, it, it just I don't know. It was one of those moments where like you, you, you see him really weighing his words, really choosing them with care. And, uh, and yeah, I mean that, that, that relationship in that other scene of him walking, marching alongside Stokely Carmichael and the relationship be between these two figures, you know, Stokely Carmichael maybe representing the nascent like black power movement and, um, and 
I, I forget who among the people who are interviewed, because in this documentary, so many people who are part of that movement get interviewed, right? And, um, but one of them is describing how King was, was voicing, or, or was demonstrating support for Stokely Carmichael as a person, you know, and, and he's almost looked up to as this father figure, I think, by many in the movement. Um, and yet he's carefully show, uh, describing how that's not me. That's not what I represent. I represent this radical vision of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of why he's so careful with his words too, because he realizes how much influence he does have. Um, and that's why yeah, I, I appreciate that he's very, very thoughtful with his words and that he really takes the time to listen to what someone's argument is or what they're saying in response to that, you know, acknowledging their side of things, but also, you know, really keeping this strong message of nonviolence in his words. I think he's also hypersensitive to the way that his words will be twisted, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think that he understands that every single syllable that comes out of his mouth is going to either be used for good or for ill. And I think he's very, very aware of that at every single moment. Um, one thing that this movie made me do, I didn't spend a lot of time doing this, um, but I was like, you know what? I'm, this is super nerdy. So I'm sorry guys to, <laughs> to expose you to the inner workings. But I was like, you know, I would like to, I'm gonna go to the historical New York Times database and I would like to look at some contemporary art articles about King during this time. And so I just, and I knew that there would be a lot. So I was like, listen, we don't have all day here. We're just gonna do like a really focused search. So I did, so, I did it something like between 1960 and 1968. And I think that I put in the search Martin Luther King and um, communist because that, that was one of the, things that like was used like this this mm -hmm. label um to try to devalue and like take away his credibility and just to um scan through the, some of that and see like just the way just the way that he was characterized you know after a certain point um was very interesting to read like it's one thing to read secondhand or like um secondary resources right about the way that this is happening it's something else to look in the newspaper and like read this article and see like how you would read this article and be like maybe this guy you know maybe this guy is um hmm, maybe we should have some more questions about what he's doing right and just think about like the role of the media in mm -hmm in the way that we interpret things, right? And like, what is the distance between somebody's actions and their words and the way that they're portrayed in the media? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely like, just you saying that kind of resonates with me because like growing up as a child, when you learn about Martin Luther King, you know, you hear about how he was such a great person, you know, everyone really loved him and, you know, all of these really good positive things nowadays, but, at first, when you first start really looking into the history and during the civil rights movement, you know, there was a lot of, you know, backlash and um, pushback against what his message was and uh, his, you know, his fight for racial justice. And he, uh, you, you don't really realize that back then, of course, you know, there was a lot of pushback and stuff, but just, you don't really see just how much he was actually, you know, characterized as like a, a bad person or a negative influence on society, um, according to some, and the, you know how the media plays into that. So it's it's just interesting to see how things were are portrayed about him now versus back then. Um, was something that I really thought about when I was watching the documentary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and sp specifically about the media. I mean, the documentary does touch on that at that moment, right? Where Dr. King gives that speech, which uh, uh, John Lewis describes as his best speech. And he said, I was, I was at the 1963, I have a dream speech, but this is the one, you know? And that really pricked my ears up because, uh, you know, this is also a thing we don't get in the Reader's Digest version of Martin Luther King in his life and times. The Riverside Church speech in 1967, where he... Um, actively, he, he takes a stand against the, the Vietnam uh, War mm -hmm. and how the place erupts. I mean, it's clear he's just completely made a uh, connection with his audience. It's resonated hugely. Mm -hmm. And then the next day within the papers, 
um, you see a little like tantalizing clips. So, so Sherlanya, I'm glad you, you, you dove in, did your research there, um, because I think it would be very interesting um, to see exactly how the, the press paints him as a traitor. I mean, he, they, the, the headlines that kind of flash uh, on the screen in this documentary say something like, you know, he's bordering on treason. He sonorously declares blah, 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 but he's a traitor. I mean, he's basically a traitor. And I mean, to, to Haley's point, um, you also uh, don't see in the varnished version of MLK's life, just the extent of the ugliness and the violence and the terror that this man needs, that he, he faces, not just in the American South, but up North. And this is something that I hope that we can like get into a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the idea that, whoa, whoa, we came up like we thought, um, and many movement figures who are in the civil rights movement being interviewed in this documentary say something to the effect of, we did not expect the reception that we got in, in the North, or we were not, ex we did not understand quite how to behave up North. And you see this footage of, I think it's Gage Park in Chicago, where, um, you know, King and, and others are there to help, I think, call attention to the poverty, the impoverishment and the, the, um, the segregation, the intense segregation of that city. Um, and he's walking past and you, you just, you see, people shouting the, uh, you know, all, all kinds of racist slurs. Um, you just, you, but you really feel it. I felt it viscerally just like watching this footage that it just doesn't get played in the highlight tapes. No. <laughs> One of the things that you reminded me of something I noticed a lot, like when we, how often we see him like ducking and how often we see him like bent down. Um, and I think that really um, communicate, I think that like those very small clips littered throughout uh this documentary um really highlights like the the constant threat of physical violence right like there's a noise and everybody's like where's the noise coming from there's something going on and he's like ducking because he knows that like at any time violence can happen and there was something where he said you know when he was being asked did it hit you he's like i've been hit so many times i'm immune to it right and that's like you know like that does something to you though. Imagine mm -hmm. that reality, or the other thing, especially. And I think that part of this might um, come from, you know, watching this in a time where, um, you know, we all need to be distanced from each other. But like, it's it was like in this case, like watching people packed in so much was like, oh yeah, that was a like people people could do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like that's sort of unique to our time. But like, so often people have his hand there, like. He, somebody's got their hands on him mm -hmm. at all times right mm -hmm. and like and that stood out to me too right like I'm a person who like I like to keep my body contained you know mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want any extra hands on it unless <laughs> they have specifically been sanctioned and mm -hmm. invited like I don't I, I'm just like nope nope no 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 <laughs> like physically like he was just had mm -hmm. people around him and sometimes it was like hands of support hands of protection and other times he's just being like yanked around yep. to be arrested again or like pushed and it was yep. just thinking about like just thinking about that was interesting again particularly probably because we live in these like please like i know they say six feet i would like 12 to 24 <laughs> precautions <laughs> hi shalanya <laughs> That that's yeah. great, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, that that really struck me too. I mean, there's footage again, like some raw footage of him stepping up to a lectern in a packed little. You know, you can almost feel like the sweatiness of this tiny little church uh, hall or this conference room where he's he's a person of great importance at this point. He's at the end of his life. I mean, 1967, um, and there there are retainers there are people who are who are who will be the ones who will push the 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 journalists out of his face i mean who's getting right in there or there are the people who um are 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 wanting to touch the great man or just 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 kind of drink him in i mean that was a really interesting um moment and 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 poignant moment um when he's uh king and his family uh make the trip up and uh to chicago and it's cold and they're in um, you know, an uh, apartment complex with no heat. And so um, they, they have to pull people together and get the furnaces stoked with coal. And 
all this, but people that all the time, like people can't believe that he's there. Like they just can't believe it's him. And and so like, you know, kids running up the stairs are like, check, you know, checking, are you, are you him? What are you Martin Luther King? And like, he's like, you yeah, sure, you know, come on in. And he's, he's, he's allowing, I think he really delights in that. You get to feel the delight of like, that he is one of those people who's going to invite, he, he doesn't shy away from the, the really like the bodily investment uh, in, in the kind of work that he is doing. And it is, a, I think, a huge sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine the sheer amount of pressure that was always on his shoulders, especially to the point where he always had people around him in, in trying to support or protect him um, because of the threat of physical violence around him. Uh, like at almost all times and and people just wanting to to see him to talk to him having that much influence uh, over over people um I, I sure as heck wouldn't be able to handle anything like that not even remotely so it is it's something that it's it's got to be an incredible feat of strength personal strength to be able to do that so that's something i really i really do admire about him mm -hmm. I want to say one more thing, um, and this kind of gets back to our, our, our conversation, our, the earlier point about the media and its involvement and in kind of, I don't know, like uh, playing a role in shaping public perception of him, but also, I mean, really um, limiting his options. You know what I mean? Like, there's that moment that uh, to me was um, just... Um, incredibly revelatory for me when you kind of get the sense you, you 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 get the message through this documentary that okay the head of the fbi mm. pers has sort of a personal vendetta against martin luther king right he's he's like it's just like he's yeah. fixated. he had so many personal vendettas though but <laughs> time back you know you i, I passed, <laughs> passed the the baton that i yanked out of your hand oh no yeah well i mean i yeah i, I get that sense i get that sense from um j edgar hoover that he had, had quite a few um but but the fact that he uh j edgar hoover is kind of going after um, the angle of we got to portray this guy as a threat to our nation. We got to portray this guy as the most dangerous man in America, um, and or the dangerous black man in America. I can't remember, but the 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 gist is like they're going to dig into his personal life, right? They're going to get into his business. Nothing is off limits. They're going to paint this man as um, a morally bankrupt individual. So they get into his infidelities, they get, and, but the thing that really stuck with me was, um, I forget who again is interviewed, but they say something to the effect of, man, toward the end there, uh, Martin Luther King really, really was, was dragging, right? He had so much on his shoulders, he was really hurting. And he, and the doctor, so much so that his doctor said something to the effect of, I think you're gonna, you might, you know, benefit from psychiatric help. And one of, uh, one of the people in his circle said, hell no, because of course that information would get out, if not in 24 hours time, in 24 days time. And that would be used to hurt him. You know, the, just the fact that he's unable to, and, and so it prevented him from getting professional psychiatric, psychological healing. And that really like struck a chord with me as, wow. Just, yeah, S sad he couldn't even try to seek help. <laughs> no, it was off the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so one of the things that like, one of the, like I was aware of, um, mm, how do I want to, so like, I feel like this movie, you know, one of the things that it wanted to do definitely is try to make sure that we see a human being when we look at Martin Luther King. So it made, it totally made sense that, um, that like his personal life, um, would would be a part of that, but one of the, but when I look at a figure who has um, reached a certain amount of um, status, celebrity, etc., and maybe this is going to say more about me and the way that I think about people than it does about anything else. It's like, yeah, that is of zero surprise, especially like we look at like you know it's nineteen sixty something. This dude is traveling all over the place. He's never at home. Um, like it's not a surprise that he would have had extramarital affairs. And when we think about like any of our, um, for example, presidents, most of them 
have had like these strings of extramarital affairs, right? So it's interesting to think about um, the way that that uh, the way that that information was being retained and potentially weaponized. And I wonder uh, what the what the um, similarities and differences of the weaponization of that information um, is between like someone between King, a black man, and between say Kennedy. Uh, who definitely had like his all sorts of things going on, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, uh, word on the street is, is that like a bunch of information about his extramarital stuff was about to come off and then come out and then he was assassinated. But like, I just wonder, you know, um, when we think about like sexual stereotypes as applied to black people, um, how, how that, how that was in the mix, right? Um, Cause like all sorts of people have affairs all the time. People are pretty gross with that sort of thing. And we're lucky when we see people who are behaving well, you know, especially <laughs> when their people have like access to like, mm-hmm. yeah, to do whatever they want to do. Right. And so I think that, mm-hmm. I think that that's an interesting lens to think about um, that side of the story. Yeah. And I think that I think that does play into the media's portrayal of, of people in uh, you know in the news and stuff too. It seems like um, from uh, the the lens of like a a black person doing something like that versus like a white person, they're very you know there is there you can pick up on differences. So yeah, I I, I agree with that definitely. Mm-hmm. One of the little moments in the movie that I was like, that makes me so curious. But when we see um, Coretta Scott King and she talks about like meeting him and when she first met him, she knew him to be like, um, you know, a preacher. And she was like, I had all these stereotypes of what that would mean. I felt like Coretta Scott King, please tell us more. (laughs) what were you think like she just in in, re- in telling that it, it was interesting because she was like yeah the man that I thought I was meeting was like super one-dimensional in comparison to the man that I came to know and if I could read <laughs> any pages in her journal it would be like the section after she was like there's more to this man that, that <laughs> just, my interest was very much piqued by that <laughs> Um, and the other like little tiny, like personal moment that I was like, that's interesting, uh, was when Harry, well, I don't know. Cause see, like I was looking at this on, um, on YouTube, uh, and at first I was looking at the wrong thing. I think I was looking at like, um, I thought I was watching this, but I was really watching like an extended version of like Harry Belafonte's interview. So I don't remember if it was in this film or the thing that I was originally watching, but they, but it was talking about when Harry Belafonte originally met Dr. King and he was surprised by his stature. He was like, I was so surprised by like how short he was. And I was like, (laughs) pause. It's like, this dude was like five, seven, which I never would have guessed. (laughs) <laughs> never you know like when we look at like the, a figure no. from the past especially one that's like got his own holiday everybody knows some of his words like I you know just don't think he's five seven which again probably says more about me in the way that I like many people like associate like height with like strength and mm-hmm. manliness or whatever mm-hmm. I'm like I'm taller than this dude what <laughs> <laughs> the guy's only like an inch taller than me yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's like, huh? I mean, U.S. Grant, U- Ulysses Grant was like five eight. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, not everybody can be like a Lyndon Johnson height. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was. I thought that that was like a really interesting detail to really like dial in the humanity. You know, mm-hmm. um, what what moments st- stood out to you? Where do you think this movie did a good job at like showing? showing him as like a person. <laughs> I mean, one thing that kind of sticks out to me was his relationship to his dad, right? Like, Let's I, get that was a, that. that's a whole discussion. Absolutely. I mean, it's complicated, right? People are complicated. Daddy King, he was called Daddy King. And speaking of Harry Belafonte, he's the one who said, I love his voice, by the way, like his voice is amazing. Um, but Harry Belafonte says something like, yeah, this is the, when I met uh, Martin Luther King's dad, Daddy King, 
that was when. Oh no, did he freeze? He did. Uh -oh. I know what he's going to say. He's going to say that was because that was when Harry Belafonte said, oh. oh, he's back. We can let him say it himself. You, oh, you sorry. For a moment. Oh, oops. Oh, yeah. Just the, the thing being, yeah, OK, that's the definition of patriarch. Right. Did you get am I back? No, you're definitely back. OK. You're all right. Right in. OK. OK. Um, yeah. And, and just getting to see footage of um, Martin Luther King's dad give sermons versus like the sermons that you see MLK give and the, the differences in style and the sense of just disapproving or kind of scratching his head at his son's civil rights and his activism um, and disapproving in it um, and disapproving in so many dimensions, it seems, of his son's life, like really seeking to control his son. I mean, it mentions, like, I, I wasn't aware of this, but um, Harry Belafonte brings it up because he says, yeah, at, at the time, you know, I was uh, married to a white woman and we had a family and we had a beautiful life in, in New York. And when Martin Luther King would visit, we, he was, um, he would just kind of take it all in. He, he liked that. And I think um, Harry Belafonte says something like, I think it's because, you know, his first love was a white woman and his dad wasn't having any of that. Mm -hmm. So like I had a thousand responses to that part of the movie, right? So like, I feel like the way that that was, like, it's like his dad, like Martin Luther King was born in the 1920s. And when his dad was like, ooh, that seems like a bad idea. He, I think, feared for the life of his child, right? Yeah. And so like, when it's like um, told in this place where it's like, well, you know, uh, when it's told in this way where it's like showing this, um, showing this photo of Harry Belafonte's gorgeous family and it's like, his dad didn't want him to have this. It's like, no, his dad didn't want uh, Emmett to <laughs> die. Right? Yeah. And these are two totally different um, ways of telling that story. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I don't know. So That's a good point. And, no, I, I, I wondered. I totally agree. Very fun agree days. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I completely agree with that. I think there was more to it than like, you can't, you know, fall in love with a white woman or anything. I think it was definitely- in Georgia? One yeah, he wanted he wanted his son to be safe. Alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then like Harry Belafonte's not an unneutral um, storyteller there either, right? So like here's Harry Bel Belafonte. He's like this guy who had like this this um, you know this career. He was like well known, you know, as a singer. He was like in all these movies, and then he had like this activism streak, right? And I can't remember how many wives that Harry Belafonte has had, but I don't think that that was wife number one. I'm not sure though that I didn't Google, um, but you know, Harry Belafonte is like, well, I had this like he Harry Belafonte made a made a choice to like have a family with a white woman, and when mm -hmm. he says that the great man may have wanted the same thing, he's now you know sort of validated what could have been a controversial decision for him at the time. So mm -hmm. you know, I hadn't thought about that. I didn't read about his biography. I don't know how he felt about that. I don't know how he processed that. But I think that that's, you know, that's a follow up question that mm -hmm. I had. And then like the other thing that I was like, this is, you know, again, they're painting him as a human and they're talking about different elements of his life. But like, I feel like there's a danger that somebody's going to walk away from that movement, from that move, from that uh, part in the movie and think like, oh, King was a great man because he liked that white girl that one time. And I think that that's a problematic, yeah. uh, I think that's problematic. Yeah, but, yeah, that sounds complicated. Like, a, like just, that. such a strong face. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm just making that face because I'm like, yeah, that was like totally over my head. I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just one way, like there are many ways, you know, I don't, I don't think that that is the point that they were making, but I do think that one could look at look at it that way right yeah. and I think that like when we have an environment I think that when we see people often making themselves the center of other people's narratives I don't think that it's a jump that some people will go there with it mm -hmm. I mean I, I think maybe it is important to say that uh, Harry Belafonte does loom somewhat large in this documentary I mean he's he he kind of gets he gets his words in a lot in this. Um, maybe, maybe I wasn't overly distracted by that, but he does. I mean, he's a, he's a major, major figure in here. 
he I mean it seems like it might like when you look at him sitting beside Coretta Scott King at um at Dr. King's funeral you know really it's like if you're if you're the one sitting next to the family like you definitely were there as much as as much as you know I believe you were there as much as you say and when you're like talking about dive bombing to get like his thrown away manuscript yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I love love that. people like Harry Belafonte who lived through um, seeing so many people like murdered. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that part of the reason I'm thinking about this is from the um, from the uh, movie about James Baldwin's life. Yeah. Same. Right. You know, like yeah. when we see the um, struggle that James Baldwin had having seen, um, you know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X and um, oh, I cannot think of the other Medgar Evers seeing mm -hmm. all of them just killed right and so like harry belafonte saw the same thing you know and yeah. saw like uh, people just being like plucked out of their movement mm -hmm. all the time and what does it mean for for you as somebody who saw all of that and survived it mm -hmm. question mark you know yeah like that speaking of weight you know that's gotta yeah. be yeah I thought they did a, a, a nice job uh, in this documentary of starting um, starting off on that um, footing of saying something to the effect of, I think um, I'm blanking on her name, is it Zer? It's an awesome name starting with an X like Zerona or the woman who like drove King to the airport to, Mem to fly to Memphis. And she's like a big, She's not just the, the driver, she's like a major uh, figure in this, in, in, in the civil rights, uh, in, in King's circle, right? Um, but she says something like, uh, um, I'm here to talk to you. I'm not telling you like tidbits here. Like this is not what this is. Like I'm telling you my, I'm telling you what I lived. And I kind of felt through what she was saying, how she was saying it, kind of what you were talking about just there, Shalanya. Just like, this is, um, I live this. This isn't just a fairy tale, just so you know. Like people were here and doing stuff and we're still here 50 years after his assassination and we have, we have been processing this for decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, you wanted to, um, you wanted to talk about um, the parts in the movie where they moved north um, and I don't want to lose that thread because we we didn't we didn't we didn't pull it when it came up. So like this is <laughs> we're pulling it. <laughs> yeah, let's pull it. Let's pull that that mm -hmm. part. Um, I okay. There's just so much, so so many places to go, and I feel like with this idea, um, and I feel woefully un, underprepared. You know, there's a lot of books that I'm imagining my like my book list, and it's like. Oh well, I want to read *The Color of Law*. Oh, I want to read that one book about the uh, diaspora, about like you know moving from s the Great Migration, I guess, from like s from south to north. Um, that that um, one writer wrote. She wrote something new called *Cast*. I'm yeah, Wilkerson. I think Isabel Wilkerson. I think it's her name. Yes, yes. And, and *The uh, Warmth of Other Suns*. I think is the name of the book you're thinking about. Yes, that is his name. That's it. Bing. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, so I haven't read any of those books. <laughs> um, but the, but I mean, just like the fact that these civil rights leaders, who I, I mean, you're you're you have I have um, I imagine many of us have this like co conception of okay, these people knew what they were doing. They were organized and they were focused and they did their stuff and they brought this uh, they brought the just the underbelly of racism to light in America and they just they succeeded. But like you're really, you're given the sense when they decide, when they decide to move operations to Chicago up north, that they are surprised at what they find here. Um, it, here being, you know, we're, we're talking in the Midwest, like here in the American Midwest. Um, and they're surprised by just the extent to which so many people are coming out uh, who are uh, openly racist, openly flying their Nazi flags and, all all the other stuff right mm -hmm. um and you get the sense that not only do you there are they confronted with this um backlash uh among white people but there is a machine operating in chicago mayor daly's machine of patronage where you know black ministers who are 
um, or somehow attached to this patronage system are, uh, are, are saying, no, no, we don't, we get, get King the hell out of here. We don't want him here either. Um, and just how intricate like this, this, how complicated this web is. It's not just like, here, we're going to, we're going to come and help some folks out and raise attention here and boom, we're done. It's like, oh, this is complicated and it has to do with power structures. It has to do with power and it has to do with like the fact that racism doesn't just exist in the South, but it's a very different type of racism that you see up North. And I just want to, I, I, was, I have a lot of thoughts, but I've been blabbing and I want to hear if anyone else has thoughts. So I, I think about, um, so sometimes like when we think about like the way, I think that I, I, I have said in other conversations, I think that racism is like one heck of a shape shifter. You know, I think that it takes different forms based on like the dynamics around it. But I think that at its core, it's the same. I mean, like if, if racism is an ingredient, I think it's eggs, right? Like it like is like, <laughs> it can bind things. It can do weird stuff. It can like emulsify things. Like I just think it takes on so many shapes mm -hmm. and it takes on the shapes that it does because it is what it is, right? And so I think that like, we just see that like, they, they were familiar with what the racism machine looks like, where they came from, and they were unprepared for the machine, the racism machine mm -hmm. where they went, right? But like, I think that the racism is the same. You know, yeah. like, I think that like, um, I think that like creating an underclass of people who are then um, able to be weaponized um, against all sorts of people and capitalized upon is the same in the South and in the North, right? And I think that when we think about like some of the things, like they were talking about the patronage system, like imagine that you're one of those guys, like you live in the racist North, you figured out that system, you figured out how to play all of your cards, you figured out a way to like mobilize and, and, and move up within the system. You have worked hard for this. You know, the people who came before you have worked hard for that. You know what I mean? And then like, here comes this guy out of the blue mm -hmm. threatening mm -hmm. everything that you've scraped for, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that like, like there are some ways where I wish that we would, um, that we would pay the attention that we pay to say, um, you know, non-educated white voters, right? Like that's what we've been hearing about for the last four years. And like, what possibly could these people be thinking? I wish that we would pay that sort of attention to other people and how they react to forces around them. And I think that we could learn so much, right? Because like when we cr try to create like this overarching narrative, that's got like these groups of people who are talked about in groups, I think it like keeps us from s seeing things that are valuable, right? Like, oh, yeah. like how do we see the commonalities and experiences if we're like being surprised by people's reactions when their situations are like totally different from each other. And I think that that's a larger thing. Like, I don't think that that's happening in this conversation, but like, that's what this made me think about, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that also like, you know, when we're in the parts of the movie where um, where he's moved north and he's looking at like the abject, po the, the what poverty looks like in the urban north, right? Mm -hmm. Like it just looks different than it does in the south. You know what I mean? Like where he had come from in the south, you know, like, but it's the same thing. If you can't eat, you can't eat. You know what I mean? If you don't have adequate shelter, you don't have adequate shelter. If you don't have medical care, you don't have medical care. And whether you're living in like this giant um, tenement and whether you're living on something where you're dipping the water out of a well that's just like those are the differences that we pay attention to but I think that the commonality in those situations is what's interesting and I think that that's why he was so threatening right like mm -hmm. when you start to, like because like if you live in a society where like black people are the lowest caste and you're talking about things that impact black people in particular you can count on a certain amount of people not thinking that's important because it's like well that's not going to impact me Right. Yeah. And I think that like, if we bring that idea to now where there's so many people who are like, I'm not going to wear a mask because I don't think I'm going to get COVID. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's not a jump to think that people are going to be like, uh, that only affects black people. I'm not going to worry about that. But like, if you start talking about poverty, 
like that's a much more threatening thing, right? Because like most people like can imagine poverty or have known someone who's like adjacent to poverty. You may or may not know somebody who's like black, right? And so I think that, um, I think that that's kind of like when you, when he starts getting more universal in the way that he's talking about things, that's where the threat came in. And this made me think about um, Bacon's Rebellion. That's the big lesson in Bacon's Rebellion, right? When, um, when all these folks from different groups are like, wait a minute, Mm-hmm. those guys have all the stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> let's get together right and that's a big lesson that got learned you know and then ever since then like all of the little groups get pitted against each other and so and and but that's what's missing out of that's what's missing out of king's story like if we stop at the i have a dream speech mm-hmm. stop at a moment where you know he's talking about like imagining in this future where um you know, where people won't be judged by their race, basically. That's what we boil out of that speech. But we leave out the parts about like what the United States is doing in the rest of the world and like mm-hmm. what's the difference between violence here and violence abroad. And by the way, the stuff that's happening to people here yeah. is violence. Like we leave all of that out, right? Yeah. Um, and it's just, I don't know, like him going North made me really think about that. And then also it made me think about um, the way that once a movement becomes successful, everybody wants a piece of that cake, you know? And so like, you know, King was successful and then like war activists were like, wait a minute, what are you going to say about this? Right. And it's like, well, he was not doing what he was doing, but you see the value. And so like, now you want, now you, now you want that. I mean, I was very intrigued by that part of the documentary. And I guess like, I want to just just react real, real quick, just generally to what you just said and just say, like, there is this sense that you get um, from this documentary that, like, there are lots of pressure, there's lots of pressure put on King to just stay in your lane, you know, like, you're the civil rights guy, stay there. Mm-hmm. So there is that. I mean, he gets castigated in the press by be- because he's this, and he yelled at, um, you know, on the streets, which you see in the documentary, because he's, uh, you know, uh, a communist a agitator now, a treasonous anti-war person who's uh, per- pers- personally against LBJ, who's done all these great things for black people. I mean, come on, he passed the Voting Rights Act and now MLK is just gonna, you know, whatever. I, I found that incredibly interesting. There's there's actual transcripts of Mayor Daley talking to L- LBJ and just how, you know, Mayor Daley's like, we gotta get this guy out of here. And also this he- guy's not your friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah just like what um uh forgot the other thing that i was gonna say though sorry uh just uh, i mean that's (laughs) let me see if i can pick it up like that that sense that like yeah he he wants to um oh i remember um the the fact that like there are these anti-war flag burning you know white kids who are saying like no we want we want king to come out and say something uh, uh about the war um it just it's complicated i want to learn more about that i i mean that's that's like something you negotiate as someone who has achieved something in a different realm right like in this realm of racial uh equity um and you're then being asked oh can you do this other thing too and can you say something about that and um and like yeah that that sense that other people like really very much want him to just spread out spread himself thin i mean you get it i don't think they want him to spread himself thin thin i think they're like you have this i want you to take your bullhorn at its full strength and i want you to talk about my thing which is different than like spreading yourself thin you know yeah like they were they definitely recognized the that effect he had on people and they wanted him to say that about their movements too because they wanted that like you were saying before they kind of want a piece of that pie um especially with people being you know these people on one side saying you need to stay in your lane you do stuff about civil rights and racial equity and that's it um but then it's also like he he was already spreading his uh movement from just talking about racial equity and like talking about poverty which does affect you know admittedly like a a larger group of people like a lot of more people do relate to that as well so i think he was already starting to reach out from 
just like from one specific topic, I guess. Um, and I think because of that, people were wanting him to start speaking on other things because he had already started to branch out. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like he, he talks about universal basic income or something like that, guaranteed annual income. I mean, these like these these concepts that, I mean, we hear like Andrew Yang and other folks, like it's floating around out there right now and it feels radical right now. And here, like 50 years ago, he was, he was Martin Luther King was starting to say things like this. Like yeah. we, we need this here now. And I don't know, that, that, was, that was striking to me. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting to see how there are certain issues that might seem like they were so far away in the past, but have actually been brought up in in recent years or in recent months even. Um, it, it's kind of interesting to see that just sort of like coming back up again and that it was actually talked about before. Yeah, like one thing that I found myself thinking about um, during this film is the um, is voter suppression, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like what it, mm, I just find myself thinking about the different ways that race is used quietly and loudly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like as I've watched coverage that talks about, um, you know, vote it, you know, just like wh whose votes are we willing to throw away? Right. And like, what is it in our society that makes it even true that someone can open their mouths and say, like, you know what, we'll certify all of the votes um, in everywhere but Wayne County. Right. And I think that it, in order to say that you have to believe that enough people will believe that those votes aren't important. Otherwise, you would never say that because it would be a liability to you. Right. And so I think this film just made me think about that, right? Because it's like, you know, there's certain things that like, if you believe that there are enough people who don't think that's important, your your cards look a certain way versus another way, right? Because there are certain things that like one might think, and I don't care what they are, everybody has thoughts that they might think that they won't say because they realize that if they say them, mm. it's a problematic thing, right? Mm. And, um, and I just this film makes me think about like how much of that is like really tied in with the with the racial hierarchy that exists like then and and now you know yeah. or like when we're watching the um pickets for the um associated with the um uh with the uh workers the i am a man yeah um pickets like that is the same idea as black lives matter like they're like that's like these guys are saying i am a man i am a person mm -hmm. like hi me yeah i'm a human being and yeah. that is the exact same idea yeah as you know as this other thing right and so like we keep seeing these ideas rise mm -hmm. and then get sanded down mm -hmm. and i think that this movie sort of like illustrated that it definitely stirs it up again yeah yeah um uh what did i want to say here yeah i guess just like um this sense that you get that you know these are there's a real crisis and there has been a real crisis of like empathy of like choosing among among like the people in power mostly let's say this is white 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 americans choosing to go, okay, like, we just don't need to care about that. We just don't need to care about um, black enfr and enfranchisement because if, and in fact, we should prevent that because that will diminish our power. So it's actually in our interest to not, um, to, to not care and to, to, to choose to disenfranchise people, specifically well, black. That's not gonna happen to you. You know what I'm saying? Like you could, um, one can find themselves poor. You like you could have a lot of money and be like poor later, mm -hmm. but like you're not going to be white and then wake up black, right? And so like it's wow. like a state. Like it, I think it's like a safer plate. You know, like you're not that. It's not a thing that's going to happen to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that there's a distance there that um, that can create that. Like when you're allocating your empathy resources, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> 
Like mm-hmm. I could imagine that being a function. I mean, you might have yeah. like black kids or black grandkids maybe one day perhaps, but you don't think that's going to, ha- like you're probably not thinking that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen to you, you know? I think that the, the challenge, yeah, with something that's kind of immutable like that, like race, you know, that's not something that it's going to be harder for it's going to be harder for someone to relate to something that they could never experience versus something that they probably could have or 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 could in the future um and i think that's where though that's one really large obstacle is getting people to have that empathy for something that they could never experience themselves um, and having the compassion to think about those people when admittedly a lot of people have a lot of things going on in their life and stuff where you just don't consider what other people could be experiencing or going through and and getting people to really think about that is important but it's it's a challenge because how do you get someone it, it can be sort of like how can you get someone who normally doesn't think about stuff like that to really consider that um you know, <laughs> one of the things I've been thinking about a lot in reading some of the like I I I gotta stop reading all of this <laughs> and stuff like it is not healthy but I can't stop. Um, in fact, it's been hard to do some of this reading and viewing sometimes because I'm like I just I just want to hit refresh and I want to read the other stories. But one thing that I've been I, this is a baby idea and I don't even know that like I might think about it a little bit more and think that like. Why, why were you even thinking this thing? It's not like not logical, but one of the things that I have seen is um, people being surprised by, um, by the way that the recent election shook down, you know, like in terms of like people quote voting against their own interests, Mm -hmm. um, things and some of the stuff that I've been reading. But like the question that I have is like, if we live in a society where many people sort of think of like their race as like the, the default or like they, um, like, you know, some white people, um, have been able to almost think about race as something that other people have. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you think about like, if your fundamental viewpoint is like race is something that other people have, or it's like not something that's central in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, I think then like, if you feel like you live a raceless existence, Mm -hmm. yeah, then I think it would be surprising the way that the election turned out. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, if you live a racialized existence, there is nothing surprising (laughs) about the way that that race turned out. Right. And so like, I wonder if like, if people feel like race isn't a daily factor, um, it's hard to imagine that race is a factor Mm -hmm. in people's voting decisions, right? Because it's like this imaginary thing Mm -hmm. until it's time to think about the race issue, question mark. I hope somebody wrote a paper about this that I can just read and like read somebody else's thoughts about this. But like, I, I, I don't know. Like that's when I listen to like podcasts and and read the articles and like hear like so much surprise. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't. I don't. I don't get it with the surprise. Mm-hmm. Like I just don't. I, I I didn't get it with the surprise last time. I remember a conversation that I had in um, 2016 with somebody you know who was like very surprised, and I was like, uh, but. I told you two weeks ago, I wasn't so sure <laughs> that things were going to go this way. And I think it's like a perspective, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, like James Baldwin, you know, like we turned to him all the time, but he's, you know, he communicated the idea, like, you know, and in his context, he's like, black people have to know about white people. Like black people know more about white people than white people know about themselves, right? And so like to listen to coverage, it's been interesting to like think about that also within the context of reading every single one of these books on this list, you know Uh what I mean? (laughs) And so it's like, you know, I don't know how much of this is just like dipping back into this like very highly steeped tea of reading all of these books back to back, but it just, (laughs) it just, I just have new questions now. 
Can, can I ask you, Sherlonia, are, when you're referring to like people who are voting against their interests, are you talking about like certain, like, let's say like the rural white voter who's voting for Trump, even though, you know, Trump has said like, uh, is giving away tax breaks to the rich and he's not especially helping that rural white guy? Is that yeah, like I am talking about that. I'm particularly talking about like the articles that I read about that. Cause I'm really trying to like think about it in terms of like, oh, in terms of what I'm reading, right? Cause I don't know any of these people. Like I don't, that this isn't my area of study. This isn't my area of expertise, mm -hmm. right? Um, but like the surprise is surprising. You know, like, why is this, why is it so surprising? Right? And it like, especially, uh, especially as we've watched the different ways that people engage with um, information surrounding the pandemic. Mm -hmm depending on its source, right? Like we have watched people react certain ways that like, is like divided ideologically, right? And so like, that's to me looks like, you know, says somebody who's like, doesn't study politics and doesn't study polls and doesn't study this stuff. But it's like, well, we're seeing something happening here. Why would we be surprised mm -hmm. that we see the same Thing happening with with another choice right mm -hmm. i don't know like these are baby thoughts again like not fully oh man baby thoughts i don't know these are like these are wild these are there's a lot of there's we could go into a lot of different directions with these thoughts you know like i mean in, into directions that like kind of blow my mind just like initially like okay how how do you believe a conspiracy how do you get that steeped in that how do you believe how do you suspend your disbelief in such a in such a great way i don't Mm -hmm. uh, um and um but but yeah i don't know like your your question about why are people surprised i mean um uh don't know don't know um it, 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 it might be it probably has to do with people's media diet right so like on one side of my mouth i'm like why are people so surprised and it's like well if you take in because at the beginning at the end of the day i think that most people make sense to themselves you know what I mean? And so like, yeah. if I believe that everybody makes sense to themselves, which I do think that mostly people do, then I must also with that believe that like, well, people must be like living in an environment and taking in information in such a way that this is a logical choice. I just don't have access to understanding the A leads to B leads to C leads to D. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I had the same, I, or maybe a similar feeling when I was watching this documentary. Again, like watching the Gage Park footage um, of just how vehement like the 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 protests are, uh, if you call it that, let's call it, the, no, it's like actually mob, mob, mob frenzy is, like how much, how palpable the rage is against Martin Luther King being in that city. And, you know, you see, you hear people shouting like, I live here, he doesn't live here, you know, get that N word out of here. And you, yeah, like those people make sense to themselves. Like it made sense to like run down to the park with your Nazi sign or the go back to the zoo sign That's and wild. shout at him, you know, like that made sense. And why does it make sense? Like, um, and, and there's this like, right, like deficit of, um understanding because you know it doesn't pay like it, there's no incentive for 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 white people to pay attention and really understand like their emotions around this this thing and um what's... no incentive that those folks can see because i would argue that there's huge incentive because think about where where that all all of that energy could have gone think oh. about like, think about what that guy's blood pressure could have looked like if he wasn't walking around with that rage think yeah. about what, what his what like if you don't have that level of True. like hatred and stuff what you, you could have been sitting on the dock of the bay wasting time right <laughs> you could with that right and You're so right. like i don't think that um yeah. i think it's like an inability to see like what freedom could come well said not having that obligation yeah. that, 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 that that documentary i mean the documentary does mention that because there's that woman right who shouts it at king and calls him all sorts of names and one of king's uh, uh you know associates says she came back like 10 minutes later and was like so apologetic she was like i i shouldn't have said any of that and and what what did it was the fact that king looked at her as she was 
you know, hurling all this at him. And he said, you know, you're, you're much too beautiful to, or much too pretty to, to say such nasty things. Mm -hmm. And then she, you know, whatever, walks away, comes back. It's not immediate, but then she's like. He activated her shame. Yeah. That's what it was. He activated her shame. You know, like, like she was in a situation where there was no shame, right? Because like, if you're with, if you're with a bunch of people who are doing something crazy, I, I have to stop using that word. That's like one of my things I'm working on. But like, you're doing something that is like not great. Um, and you're doing it with other people. Like you as a group might not have the shame, but he looked her in the eyes and was like, for real, this is, this is who you are. And, and activated, activated the sense of shame. Right. Like, I think that, like, I think about, I think about the idea of shame often, right? Because like, I feel like we are in a place where like we talk about like the um, dangers that come with shame, but we don't talk about no, shame's um, good. its purpose. You know, like, I think there's a reason that we have shame. And I think that shame run amok is a problem. Just like, I think that like confidence run amok is a problem. Sadness run amok is a problem. Uh, you know, being carefree run amok is a problem. Shame run amok is a problem, but shame has its purpose. Yeah, you know, when when I saw that, when they were talking about that in the documentary, at first I was kind of confused. I was like, what made her, I was like, what made her decide to think on that and then come back and apologize? And that makes a lot of sense. Like, because being in, in the group like that mob mentality, you know, they're all thinking the same thing. They're all validated by you know the other people around them doing the same things while everyone else is doing it i'm going to do it too because i feel angry and mm -hmm. upset so you, she was you know saying vile things and mm -hmm. and then being singled out like that and you know you're much too pretty to be saying such nasty things you know like you were saying that must have triggered that sense of shame in her um and caused her to think about it. so i didn't really think about it like that so thank you <laughs> It makes yeah, a lot I, more sense to me now. <laughs> I have a real hard time like identifying with any, I mean, I'm so uncomfortable in crowds. Just period. Uh -huh. Doesn't matter where we are. It could be, could oh, be yeah. in the library, you know, amongst all my peoples. But just even then it's like, I'm not, I'm not happy when uh, there's just a bunch of people. I'm just not happy because anything goes, you know, you're anything goes. And, and I think you lose a lot of like your sense of, um, you know, your balance. It, it seems like you, you become, you adopt the balance of this particular group of people, which could mm -hmm. be when activated by a demagogue or whatever kind of uh, serious event triggers, I mean, triggers any untold violence. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like this movie introduced us to like, Martin Luther King, the charmer. And I was just wondering if you guys saw that and what that felt like to witness that. If you feel like that's something you guys might look deep, you guys might lean into the camera and be like, no, that was just you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, you're, I, uh, well, you go ahead, Haley. Uh, um, so I, I agree with that, that I, you do kind of see this like charming side to him and how I, I think a lot of it also comes from this fact that it's like you already know of him as this really great figure in history, right? Um, but getting to see more of his human side and like some of his sense of humor, um, and weirdly enough, so weirdly enough for me, the whole uh, the, the the family gathering thing, kind of towards the end of the documentary, where they talk about you know them all getting together and. Uh, Dr. King sings as they play the piano and just like that kind of getting a picture of that family scene is really kind of where that's kind of where I saw the charm in him as a person um getting to see like the those little bits of like joyous moments in his life um is really where I I kind of saw the charm of him as a person um because I think those those happy moments um and, and like those moments of enjoyment that you get with other people is kind of where you start to see like the, the, the light inside people, you know? Um, so at least for me, that's really what kind of made me really feel for him as a person, especially. Um, just seeing that like, you know, he can laugh and, and sing and do everything, all these, you know, he's, he's another person, just like all of us, even if he's this really great regarded figure 
um, in the civil rights movement and people just like, you know, people are basically just cheering and cheering until he came to that church and spoke um, when he was just ready to go to bed and all that, you know, like he has such power and, and, and charm in that regard, but getting to see this other side of him, this human side is what I found most charming about King. So. <laughs> Yeah, wasn't one of his confederates saying something like, man, he could be like the, he had, he could be nasty with his like sense of humor. He could really, he could really like rake you over the coals if he wanted to, you know, and like, I don't know, he could like, he'd be like, you know, don't get yourself killed, but don't worry if you do, I'm going to preach you the best eulogy ever, so don't even worry about it. And then he'd like launch into this eulogy where he'd compare you to like some, demon in the bible or whatever like all kinds of I, I, I mean that that was like kind of news to me like what? okay like, um and there was that one guy who who got enter, who said something interesting like something along the lines of yeah, yeah he would I mean he wouldn't he wouldn't go on go hard on you if he felt like you couldn't take it but I could take it so he was always you know cussing me out or like saying this about me and I was like whoa okay and but the thing that really like caught me was like the man was having a pillow fight with his friends in the Lorraine motel like an well, hour that's heartbreaking to me like it's just like really like I I'm know. glad you got to have your pillow fight though like because that sounds really <sighs> fun like I'm glad that you got to have that fun but like you had like oh like man like you're just a dude you know just a person yeah being a person yeah Mm -hmm. so like my favorite moment of his charm was when they when they did the interview and someone's like oh new york a fun city and he's like well now i'm a baptist preacher so i don't know that i've had the chance to get in i was like that's i feel like that look in his eye is like is like the look that maybe got used uh, here and there when he was finding his extracurricular activities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I felt like that, uh, that for me personally, watching that footage, I was just, I was like a little embarrassed. I was feeling a little, I was feeling the awkwardness of like this. I mean, he's not, it's, it's one thing to have that kind of conversation off camera with someone, but like you're saying, like, that 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 look that he got like in that moment like it's kind of an intimate look yeah i feel like that's a look that he get like i felt like we now know what he looks like when he's flirting with somebody like well now you know i'm a married man and i shouldn't be saying this but uh you've inspired me to say that like i just feel like we saw just a, a glimmer of of that but see you know like i'm the same person who's like i think they all do it and now we know <laughs> now we know what it looks like when when he did it um, <laughs> uh i'm not pro-adultery i just want to say that for the record <laughs> i feel like i'm like real loose and talking about like <laughs> people but i i just feel like i needed to not make it seem like that like I'm i got you um (laughs) what did we not talk about that you were hoping to talk about today kind of covered a lot of i i really wanted to talk like like what we just talked about like is you know the those human moments and the charming uh, his charming personality you know so (laughs) i'm glad we just got to cover that so (laughs) Yeah, there's probably some more that I really want to say, but I don't know. I mean, there's like that that notion. I'll just I'll just put this out there and maybe we can talk about it or maybe we can go, yep, that's a thread we can just keep in our sweater for later. But <laughs> um just, you know, like the 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 uh, back to that notion of like toward the end of his life, King gets really s- vocal about saying, look, we need a guaranteed annual income for people because what poverty does, it, it pushes people, right? It, it, it demeans people. It diminishes um, this nation. And he mentions like how this nation is sick, like it's sick. And one of his, um, I think someone in his circle says something like, you know what the FBI was doing and like keeping, like recording every phone call that was some, that was just sick. Like those people are sick. Um, and, but, 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 and so there's that, but there's, there's just this sense of like the overall like sickness of the nation. But, but for, I think his Confederate, like 
the fact that the FBI was just bringing so much to bear on pushing this man down speaks to how just um, sick the nation is. And like, what's that mean? Like, how does that sickness get healed? And like, what, what, what's going on there is just a thought that I had. And the second thing that I want to just express is that um, just that, that like Harry Belafonte again, you know, um, you love, you love to hate him. Not, not quite like he, but the, <laughs> you don't, he's great. Um, I, 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 I didn't, I, this, this conversation has been very uh, elucidating for me because I just didn't really get the sense that like he had an agenda and I kind of see your point on that one. Yeah, sure. I'm not saying that he necessarily had an agenda, but like, it's a thing, like, you know, he was married when he was married. And like, even now interracial marriage is not like a neutral thing no. you know what I mean like it's not like we we might depending on the circles you run in you you might you might see somebody and feel like okay that's fine but like that's not necessarily you know not mainstream that's and and when he was married you know as a civil rights activist he's not mm-hmm. he's not neutral yeah mm-hmm. not neutral yeah. we not I mean that said like you can't expect somebody to be neutral about their own personal relationships. Like we should not be neutral about our intimate choices. Mm-hmm. But like, I do think that his point of view, you know, you know how like you have people in your life when they tell you a story, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna wait for the rest of that story before I figure out how to file that. And I think that this- <laughs> the story that it's like okay I wonder what the rest of that story looks like before I figure out I like Harry Belafonte I think you know he's just been like so vocal for so long you know and there's a story about like how he had this opportunity to meet Nelson Mandela when Bill Clinton was president and he wanted to like it was like you know for somebody like him who's like been a part of the causes he's been a part of like that would have been a great moment but he felt like it would have been hypocritical of him because of some of the um foreign policy decisions that bill clinton had been making so he refused right like this is somebody who you know tries to like walk his talk but yeah um yeah you know i just thought that that was i was just like hmm and put a post-it note on that one. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, yeah. that's the equivalent. Yeah, like that's as much notice as it gets. Like I'm not like, liar, you're trying to create a narrative that isn't true. But I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna go on ahead and put a post-it note on that page. Fair yeah. enough, fair <laughs> enough. And yeah, I gotta say, I don't know much about the man, but I get the sense that, you know, he was in the thick of this, right? From like from the beginning to the end. And I mean, through it all, through it all. And um, something that he said that also struck with me, stuck with me was, was this idea of like this tick that he was noticing Martin Luther King having and this tick showing up in speeches and this tick kind of showing up to people who are close to him is like, this is something that's going on. And then it just goes away one day. And Harry Belafonte asked him like, what happened to the tick? And without missing a beat, according to Harry Belafonte's version, MLK says, I just made my peace with death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Can you imagine that though? Like every, like you just, like the threat is so imminent that like, it's just there, you know? Yeah. That's, that's. It's an ever present thing kind of looming. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that. I don't know how that must feel. I but wonder- But felt like how- he had a calling, you know what I mean? And yeah. Like, like that, like intellectually, like people feeling like they have a calling. I understand that yep. that's something that happens, but that is not a thing that I understand. Like there's certain kind, like I feel like, I feel like as, um, I always use like um, technology to like talk about humans, uh, but like, I feel like that's like an expansion pack or something I don't have, like <laughs> understanding like what that calling would feel like. To me, it's like you decide to do things and you either achieve them or you don't. Like a calling is something sure. really to. Um, yeah. Morale is sort of like that. I understand that it is a thing. I understand it is real. I understand you have to what? manage it. I, morale. Morale. I understand that it's something like, especially like if, um, like if you're responsible for managing people, you must think about it. I don't know what it feels like. Like I don't have access to that feeling. I know how to 
identify it. Like I know how to tell when something it's like, it's like, um, it's like a language I understand, but I can't speak. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like a calling is like that. It's a language I understand, but I can't speak it. But mm -hmm. like people who feel like intimately, like they are called to do a thing. They just operate like on this other mm -hmm. yeah. plane. They, they, they mentioned that in the documentary, right? It's like moving from political to spiritual. It just mm -hmm. ascends to this level for King, uh, uh, at least of like, this is, this is it. This is why I'm on earth. And see, like, I don't think that, I think that for us, these things live in different drawers. I don't think they live in different drawers to him. And I think that like when he, cause like, he's very much like to me, like when I'm watching this movie, like I think about him and I think about his educational past and I really see the philosopher, right? Like he like is constantly asking himself questions and constantly like thinking about things. That's why that, you know, they're saying like, oh, he could wake up and give a sermon. That's, be that's because he's constantly thinking <laughs> about the things, you yeah. know what I mean? Like he's battling all the time. He's writing those things and throwing it away because he's thinking it out all the time. Right. And so like, if he believes certain thoughts about like human dignity and about, um, uh, uh, let's just say human dignity. And then he's like directly asked a question about say the role of war, like the philosopher then has to integrate that question into like what he already believes and then it's like a part it lives in it lives in a large drawer right and so like I, I think that that's one of the things that we I don't know that's the way that it looks from the outside right like certain things that may live in separate places for us don't for him it, is, is that why you think let me just ask, like, there's a moment, do you remember the moment in the documentary where he describes how he feels stuck? He is stuck. He has to, almost stuck in this position of ant of opposing the war in Vietnam. I'm stuck. Like, do you remember that? Am I misremembering? Oh, so. Yeah. So because I think that he thought about it and he was like, okay, well, if I am, if I am, if I am trying to, if I am, um, if I am trying to attain the sense of morality, that I believe in, that's the baseline of my faith, that's the baseline of my work, that's the baseline of everything that I believe in, that is integral to my calling. If I am to engage that, this is, I got to open door number two. If I open door number two, everyone who was with me when I was opening door number one, not going to be with me anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I do? Yeah. I am stuck. I am stuck. I am stuck. I am stuck. Mm -hmm. Like I do think that those ideas are, are, are married, you know? And that's why I think that, that's why I think that, um, you know, that's why I think that we can look at him and say like, oh, well, what he was talking about grew. And it's like, well, I think his platform grew. And then I think that, you know, mm -hmm. Spider-Man style with great power comes great responsibility. I think he felt that. I think that he was like, oh man, I am being called upon to speak on this thing. And he does not believe that that is an accident. He believes that like he has been placed on this earth mm -hmm. to provide, you know, this, this to, you know, he thinks that God has put him on this earth to do this thing. And he is trying to figure out the best way to be honest and, um, and do that with integrity. Mm -hmm. And that's why he, that's why he was like, well, you know, I'm going to have to break with LBJ on the war because it's the right thing to do. You know, mm -hmm. while other people were like, seriously, there's a 1908 born Texas dude who half of us probably thought would never sign anything good because he is from Texas. Mm -hmm. He signed all of this legislation and you're going to break with him on a war? What? Mm -hmm. You know, but like people, they're solving different problems. They're like mm -hmm. the they're looking at things differently, right? Or like you see all of these different movements, or all these different organizations who are looking at the issues um, surrounding like civil rights or equality or whatever you want to call it, depending on like people's point of view, like they're solving different problems. You know what I'm saying? Like you got one set of people who are like, look, you guys tried nonviolence and people keep throwing stuff at you and you have to duck every 10 seconds that's not working all right you know yeah. like again people make sense to themselves yeah you know? and I, I i think with I, I, i'm trying to figure out how i how i'm tying this into what you had just said um kind of like back to the this whole like you're breaking on 
the issue of war um and how he felt it necessary to speak up on it because it was the right thing to do right um i think part of the reason he felt so like the part of the reason he felt so stuck like we were talking about is that um along with doing this like it is the right thing to do he knows that he wants to speak on this you know and based on his beliefs you know that this war is not right um but in doing that what kind of sacrifices are you making that might affect your cause as a whole as well so i feel like to some aspect there has to be this strategizing where it's like you want like we have to do this this is something we are eventually we're getting pressured to talk on um and also being there's this pushback and stuff like no stay in your lane um Mm -hmm. and then having to make sense of like okay well how do we go about this how do i do this without you know upending the movement you know in a big way um and and eventually it's just kind of making peace with this like okay we're going to have to make sacrifices because this is the right thing to do and then in the after that I, I i believe after that it was like a lot of people didn't want anything to do with king for quite a while after that and you know like these there are these sacrifices that were made but in the end he spoke up for what he believed was right um mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the things about like the stay like um the part where people are indicating, you know, um that he should stay in his lane. I found myself thinking about like um again, like how the racial component plays into that, right? So like he's mm-hmm. um, you know, he's being told to stay in his lane within the context of the Vietnam War. It's like, oh, you, you know, you're qualified to talk about race and race only, basically. And they didn't say it like that. That was kind of like the undercurrent. But what's interesting, like you know, I love Lyndon Johnson. He's my president boyfriend. Um, but like, he's the president during his time. King certainly was a much more educated man than Johnson was, but like Johnson can make decisions about the war, but this guy's got to stay in his lane. You know what I mean? It's like the juxtaposition of the two like screams oh, out yeah. um, during during this, <laughs> when I was watching this, like uh, every time I saw that, or like in the New York Times articles that I looked at, it was like, he's, he's just gone too far you know what I mean and then um and you know again like I'm playing my hand I guess right because I value education and that's like the that's the card that I used I'm like well you know what I feel like he had a I feel like he had a card to talk about this because he was a highly educated man you know what I'm saying we all bring our you know our stuff into it but like that's a thing that Mm -hmm. um that I'm curious about like just you know, like when we think about him, we think about the civil rights movement, right? So like we are going to think about race when we think about him, but like on the micro level, where are the ways that this, you know, that race played into what people were saying and thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Like had he been, I mean, like had he been a white activist who was like, champion for civil rights he would have been seeing you know some of the things would have been saying it's like you are a traitor you are absolutely a traitor you know what I mean but like would he be would he would like stay in your lane you know what that thing? you know what that kind of reminds me of um it kind of it kind of reminds me of how this might mirror in present day um with this whole like you know you aren't qualified to make these decisions or speak out about this um it kind of reminds me of like if we're going back to the the kneeling on the football field a lot of players you know um uh, uh, like a lot of athletes in particular speaking out about like the black lives matter movement um and how there's a lot of this backlash of like oh gosh i forget who said it um but like there was this one news anchor who was just like you know shut up and dribble to yeah thank you i'm like i can't remember her name for some reason um you know where it's like you know you guys are athletes you're not qualified to talk about stuff like this or you know like this isn't what you do so stay out of it like you guys are not activists you are athletes or where like Mm -hmm. it kind of mirrors back to like dr king like you're the you're the civil rights dude you know you're the civil rights guy. You're not. You don't need to be speaking on war, which is something that the president would clearly know more about than you, or something. You know, like that kind of argument. It just it made me think about that. How that kind of mirrors things that we've seen today. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I thought I think that some the super interesting about thinking about um, you, you like when you take a figure right who crossed times and crossed issues like the parallels. Mm-hmm. That, 
that one can see, you know, I think that's, that's super, super interesting. Yeah. So what is, so I'm going to ask my favorite wrap up question. <laughs> uh, you guys, you guys give a good conversation. So like you guys got to come back to more of these because this was, this is fun. Um, why did this make you want to learn more about? The one thing I definitely wanted to look more into is, um, what was the word you used, Lauren? Uh, God, I, I, I don't remember. Um, but just like the, the differences between, you know, how racism, uh, exhibited itself uh, in the south versus the north with when it came to the civil rights movement i i really do want to look more into that because i honestly don't feel like i am very knowledgeable about that um so when that was like a talking point in the documentary i was definitely like that's something i want to look more into um i'm very curious to, i'm very curious to know more about that <laughs> yeah me too i think uh like I said earlier, you know, it just made me conscious of my reading list here of like, I really do want to understand how, I mean, there's this straightforward guise of racism in the South, and it's sort of the story that we all were raised as Americans on. Oh, well, the South, you know, there was slavery and plantations, and then Civil War happened, and okay, there's sort of some Confederate flags flying still, but yeah, they're racist back, you know, there's, there's some backwoods stuff here, but, you know, otherwise we're clean. Um, and, and, and it's just, it's just not the story. It's not reality. And I think this is a really, like, I think of a gaping hole in my personal, um, American public school education, <laughs> right, is like, I didn't get that. I didn't really understand the, just the immensity of that movement of the anti, out of the antebellum South and upward into the factories and the you know and the, the the urban ghettos of the North that mm -hmm. Black people moved into right and I didn't really understand I still don't <laughs> understand uh, like I still got to read these books um, you know just like how how um, the infrastructure is brought to bear to to keep Black people in their places right which is at the bottom of the caste system. Um, in America. In, um, and so, yeah, The Color of Law is a book that I want to read, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other book by Isabel Wilkerson, whose name escapes me, but you already told me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look that up again. I'm going to Google that. But that, mm -hmm. that, that's really where my mind goes, because, I mean, something that the documentary King says in this documentary, um, which is very interesting, is this idea that okay, we talk about welfare, and what do you think about? Well, you think about the poor um, Black person who's undeserving of this, and it's a handout, and it's all this loaded, weaponized language, right? Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the American suburbs were built on handouts. The American welfare state was mobilized to create the highways and expressways and the, the, the building lots that created the white, right, suburban fever dream of post-World War II America. So we need to look at that and we need to think about what the difference, I need to think about what the difference is between why do we say it's one thing for when we give it to the rich white people and why do we say it's another thing when it's given to the impoverished um, black person and um, that's just a very or, or or why do we think about the impoverished black person when a certain percentage of um, a certain percentage of that aid is going to impoverish black people and then the rest of it is going to impoverished other people like why is oh. it that black person is the one that we're thinking about yeah Question mark like I'm not saying like I'm I'm at I'm agreeing with you yeah that's not pointed at you <laughs> no no, no. I, I I think that's a very very important clarification there because I mean I don't know someone someone just clued me into the fact that a Washtenaw Reads book was two dollars a day that was like a book from I don't know a year or so ago where that was the big book that everyone read and it's about yeah the fact that like um <laughs> Yeah, this is not like there. There's a perception created, right? That sort of began with this like welfare queen, mo most recently with under Ronald Reagan, of like we're going to find like the worst caricature uh, ever of someone who's abusing the welfare state, and it happened to be a black lady, right? And then so the welfare queen became this like myth, right? When in fact there's all kinds of people of uh, a white black all who are poor. 
and and that and so there's that uh, maybe there right and there working very very hard mm. to make it all work together you know what i mean yeah. like like right. working very hard to just keep things together from point a you know to point b right and so like when we think about like again people making sense of themselves right like if we're thinking about like, well, where does it, where some of the like animosity and hatred come from sometimes, like if you are hustling and struggling to like do what you need to do for your family, mm -hmm. and then you get this narrative about like these people who you've never seen because they don't live anywhere where you live, you haven't interacted with. And like, like they're, you know, getting these imaginary resources mm -hmm. that you don't have access to. Why wouldn't you be mad? Mm -hmm. You know, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you hate these people when you're trying to figure out, um, when you're trying to figure out like how to make your stuff line up and like, you're going to job number two, or you're doing whatever it is that you have to do to just make it to the next day. Right. Like a very that, enticing, um, uh, narrative. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and what we're not encouraged to do is like step back and try to integrate all the threads, I think, um, so this made me want to learn more about Daddy King. Like he is the character in this documentary that I'm like, tell me more about this guy. Because what does that mean, right? Like when you're, you know, like you're doing your thing, you, you know, you have a son who you have to bury, mm. you know, and 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 this is and this is who he was. Like what, like, what is that like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so this feels like the natural wind down. I feel like if we were in the room together, it, <laughs> we'd all like look at each other. Like, are, are we winding down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been really fun. I really enjoyed, I mean, yeah. this it's been really interesting and great. So I hope that other people who might be watching this later on get something out of it. Um, Harry Belafonte, if you're watching this, I apologize. You know, um, <laughs> I, I think very highly of you and I, I gotta, <laughs> gotta, gotta read your Wikipedia profile a little more thoroughly, but. <laughs> you know, so I'm gonna tell a small story about it. I read this book a long time ago and it was talking about like Harry Bel Belafonte, like um, read a bunch of books. He wanted to learn more about like history and stuff like that, but he was like very self-educated, right? So like he was starting to read the stuff and he was like reading all these books and he's like checking out the footnotes because he wanted to learn more. Um, but like he wasn't, he didn't come out of like this academy situation. And so mm -hmm. he went to the library and was like, you know what, I need to find the books by IBID. Right. And I just like I such yes. a um who is Ibid? Yeah, who is Ibid? Because Ibid <laughs> knows the things. And I would like to know the things. And it was, um, I'll never forget that. I think I read I like that, that many years ago. But like I I he's just an endearing uh every time I see him, I'm like, oh <laughs> <laughs> hi Harry. <laughs> Which, if he watches this, he just please ignore that last part because it was kind of weird. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your willingness to participate in this conversation and your willingness to just like grab the bull by its horns and, and wrestle it today. Thanks. Well, thank you for, for hosting this. Yeah, no problem. Good.